Well, let's pick up from where we left last week. We started talking about uh, our identity. And uh, identity is so important. If we don't understand our identity, then uh, we don't know exactly what to do. And you've got to understand identity is so important. And I'll be able to share with you just a little bit. So last week we started when we went through Psalms chapter 8 when David was talking actually that when he considers uh, the, the works of God's hands, the sun and the moon and the stars, he says, marvelous are your works. Then he turns around and says, who is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've, uh, you've made him a little lower than the angels and you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. So here David was saying, I've come to realize that you are mindful of man and you're visiting man and you have made him in your image and you have given him dominion. Well, we see from Genesis chapter one that when God created man, he created man in his own image and after his own likeness. And then God may say to the man that you have dominion over the earth over the birds of the air and over the animals in the sea. So man was given dominion, authority of rulership over the works of God's hands. And so David was saying, who is man that you're mindful of him, that you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. And therefore we see man was created by God to have rulership over what? Over the works of God's hands, whatever God has created. Man was created to be in rulership. Now you understand that when man disobeyed God, then the glory that was upon man lifted up. And so because of disobedience, man sinned. And because man sinned, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means when man disobeyed God, then the glory of God that was upon man lifted up. And as a result of that, now we were not able to function the way we ought to function. We are not able to live the way we are supposed to live. Why? Because there is something that was in us that is no longer in us. And as a result of that, we cannot be able to hit the mark, so to say, as we ought to hit the mark. And so as a result of that, God promised and said the seed of a woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. And as a result of that, God is going to reconcile us back to himself through his son. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who came to the earth, gave himself for us, went to the cross, was crucified, shed his blood, was buried, raised up from the dead, and we were justified, justified through his resurrection. And now we have been made right with God. In other words, Jesus Christ came to bring us back to our original position where we were meant to be and what we were meant to act like. And so that is what God wants us to do because if you think of it, what did Jesus really come to do? Show us that he can do a few miracles and heal a few people and then go to heaven and say, I'll come back and get you guys? No. no. He came to show you how a son ought to live on earth and how a son ought to have a relationship with the father. And that's why he says, when you see me, you have seen the father. And what I do, you shall do also. In other words, this is how a son is supposed to live. And this is how a son has a relationship with the father. And the relationship I have with the father is I only say what I hear my father say. And I only do what I see my father do. In other words, we are having one relationship with the Father. We are united. We are one. We are not divided. And therefore, when we have the image of God, God gave us his image. He created us in his image. And after his own likeness, why? Because what God sees matters to him. And therefore, he gave us his image and after his likeness. So when he sees us, he's seeing himself. So when you begin to speak, you speak like him and he sees you speak like him. Why? Because we are imitators of God. MF I shared with us this morning, be imitators of God as his dear children. In other words, God wants you to imitate him because you have his nature in you. And so when God sees you, he sees himself. In other words, he sees Christ. He sees you through Christ. And when he sees you through Christ, he sees his image through you. And therefore now you need to act like him. Speak like him. And live like him. Why? That is what he intended man to be. And now if you do not understand your place, it will be challenging for you to function from that place. And having gone through that, now we understand that if one man's disobedience made many to be sinners, therefore one man's obedience did what? One man's obedience will make many 
to be righteous. Amen. That is in Romans chapter 5, verses 19. You realize one man's disobedience made many sinners. But through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. In other words, you have to decide whether you want to be righteous or not righteous. And now you, re- you realize that we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a little bit about righteousness. This is now not, not about what you are doing. This is what someone has already done, and that is Jesus Christ. And so how did God do this to be able to make us righteous, be able to go through all that today? And therefore, we find our identity through Christ. And our identification with Christ is what makes us who we are in him. And therefore, if we talk about identity, the dictionary actually says identity is the same thing. The same thing. It means similarity or same as one. So if, if I say I have this phone and I need an, identi- an identical phone, you have to give me one same as this one. Not one that looks like this one, but one same as this. So whatever this phone is, it's going to look the same as that. And therefore, when we find our identity in Christ, we are going to be same as him. Sometimes that messes people's brains because you say, how can I be like him? No, he made you to be one through what he went through. And therefore, when you are the righteousness of God, you'll realize it is because of what he did for you. Let me put it this way. Because of sin, no one could stand before God as right or as just. So God put in Christ everything he wants you to be. He put in Christ everything he wants you to be. So that when you accept Christ, you are in him so that that you can be everything that he is. So whatever he is, you are when you've accepted him. And therefore now you can function like him, yet you're not him. You can speak like him, yet you're not him. Why? You have his nature in you. And therefore, when we talk about the identity, we are talking about we are identifying with Christ. We are one with him. That's why when we are one with him, it means it's the same thing. What he is, you are. And that is the nature of God that is in you. And therefore, if you do not understand your identity, it will become an issue. I remember uh, last month we were flying out. And so we went through the security checkpoint and we had our tickets. And so when we came through the TSA checkpoint, we had to give them our tickets. And then they say, may I please see your identity? No, I smiled on the inside, not smile on the outside because they are serious, they're doing whatever they need to do. And so they, you don't need to cause, case, cause chaos where they, there need to be no chaos. I've given you my, uh, my airplane ticket. You are seeing me. I'm not fighting with somebody to say that this is my ticket, this is your ticket, this is my ticket, this is your ticket. Somebody needs to help us out. I've given it to you. Why do you still need my identity? Because it's me. I did not steal it from everyone. anyone. If I did, someone would be running after me, and you will know that it is not mine, but yet they still wanted my identity. So we had to produce our identity card, and they had to look at it, and they had to allow us to go, which means they're saying, are you really the person who says you own this plane ticket? Are you really the person who is going to board this flight that is about to take off from this airport? I want to make sure that you are the one. Give me something that is same as the one that you're giving me on this paper. So we had to produce that. And when we were coming back, they had to do the same thing, but unfortunately, MFO's identity card was not working. She just received a new one, and so they tried to look at it and scan it through, and it's like, it's not working. And so, it's not our problem. You asked our ID, you gave us the ID, the government gave it to us, and you're working for the government, so I don't make IDs, they make the IDs. (laughs) And so they say, do you have your passport? Say, nope, we don't have our passport. Do you have any form of identification? So we had to go through, and she pulled up another identification, and they got it, and I had her, the lady saying to another, because they had to call the manager to come, and she had to say, I'll let her go 
because she's already produced another form of identification, but otherwise we're gonna hold her here. Why? Because you don't produce identification, which means your identification is very important. It is so important because we wanna make sure that you're the same person you say you are. That's why you bank your money in a bank, and when you go to withdraw it, they say, are you really the person who has kept this money here that wants to withdraw it? So we wanna see an identification. I'm the one who put the money in here. I'm not just walking and say I need the money. They say, show me your ID. Why? We wanna make sure that you're the same person. Otherwise, you may be somebody else. And so your, identi uh, your identity is very important. That's why people like to steal identity, so that they can act like you, so that they can get your results. But you know what? The reason why they are stealing it, they don't understand who they are, but they know who you are, and if they can act like you, then they can get your goods. So identification is very important, and if you don't know, and you try to act on who you are not, then you become frustrated and you become defeated. A good example is in the book of Acts when you have the seven sons of Sceva. These guys were magicians, they were doing stuff, they were sorcerers. And then they saw Paul come and preach in the name of Jesus. They say, we don't have that in our bucket. So let's add the name of Jesus into our bucket. So they were called, and there was this guy who was demon-possessed. And so they say, let's use this new one that we saw. We are joy in the name of Jesus. And that demon woke up and said, hey, wait a minute. Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But who are you? In other words, are you the same you are using authority that you do not understand. Jesus gave us his name. He says, in my name you shall cast out demons. In other words, do you understand who you are? Do you understand that you are one with him? That when you are speaking in that name, it is as good as he's the one who is speaking. And so the demons say, you don't know who you are. And as a result of that, they were frustrated. They were beat and they were defeated. Why? Because they were trying to act in an authority that they did not understand. They were abusing the authority. And therefore, we have to understand who we really are. If we understand who we really are, then it will help us flow with the authority that we have. And therefore, when someone steals your identity, they are trying to act like you so that they can get your results. But if they know what you have prepared, they'll never steal your identity. That's why if someone tries to steal your card, Immediately you get a phone call from your bank, say, did you ever do this? Why? Because you are protecting your identity. And therefore, in order for you to identify with Christ, there is a consequence that you have to meet. And the consequence is what MFA shared with us today, as many as received him, to them he gave them the right. So you are given the right to op operate as the son of God. In other words, you are given the right to be a child of God. And once you understand you've been given the right to be a child of God, then now you can begin to function as a child of God. And therefore, with that, then you are able to begin to flow and function like him. Why? Because I have the right. I have met the consequences. What is that? Accepting Jesus as my Savior. Accepting Jesus as my Lord. Now I have a right to the name of Jesus. I have a right to the blood of Jesus. And I have a right to the word of God. Why? I have been authorized to function in this authority in this identity that I have and if that is so then in Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 tells us something Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 it says as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him the word walk there simply means live in him in other words as you have received him you walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. In other words, now you begin to understand who is he that I received? Because if you don't understand whom you received, then you cannot walk or live in him. Because you don't know who he is. If he was just represented to you that he's just the son of God and that's all, then who is this son of God? Who is he? I want to know what he did. I want to know who he is so that I can walk or live in him. Because that is what I've been told. As therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. In other words, live in him. Therefore in him I live, move, and have my being. Glory be to God. And therefore, 
We need to continue to live as we have received him. We need to continue to follow him as we receive him. In other words, now my, life, my lifestyle changes when I've received him. <laughs> if you are a believer and your lifestyle is still the same the way you are, it means you don't understand who you received. Because you're told to live in him, follow him. So in other words, when I received him, something special happened to me. And whatever special happened to me, it, it enabled me or empowered me to live a different kind of lifestyle. I moved to this country from another country. I am able to live like one in this country. Why? Because I have been empowered to live in this country because I'm in this country. If I'm not in this country and I try to live like one who is in this country, it is going to be very challenging and, and frustrating. Because the laws that are in that land are not the same that are in this land. I can't go to the country where I came from and begin to drive on a different side of the street because that's how it is in America. I'm going to be in trouble. Why? Because those are not the laws that are governing that land. When you come to Christ Jesus, when you have received him, you have been empowered to live in a specific way because the place that I am in, there, is, there are laws that govern that place. And so in Christ, I have to live and follow him. If I'm not living like that, then I'm going to have issues in life. And therefore, I have to know whom did I receive. And if I know whom I receive, then I have to live by those principles. I have to live the way he is. That's why we were told we were raised up together with him and made to sit together in heavenly places, far above every principalities and powers and dominion and every rulers of darkness in this day and age. In other words, God did not only, God did not only save us, but he brought us to a place of authority, and that is where our life begins. Amen. So many times we think our life begins on earth. And we try to make it well on earth. No, you are living from heaven on earth. Because we are raised up together with him. And made to sit in heavenly places and that's where you begin. Don't begin on earth and say, okay, now what are we going to be tomorrow? See all these things that I'm facing. No, no, no. Whatever you are facing is subject to change. That's why you are ambassador for Christ. You have been anointed and sent on earth to make a difference. That's why the creations of the earth are yearning and waiting and expecting to see the sons of God. Who are they? Those, that's you and that's me. Earth is waiting to hear your voice because earth responds to the voice of God. That is the creation of God. And when God speaks, the trees begin to clap. The, trees be, uh, the stones begin to praise. The, the oceans begin to worship him. Why? Because they understand the creator. Now you've been given the DNA, the nature of the creator. And he says, the heaven belongs to the Lord. And the earth he has given to the sons of men. And therefore, you be in my authority and begin to put things in order. Amen. If anything is out of order, it's because we're not saying something. And we could not be saying something because we don't know whom we received. Because if you know whom you receive, then therefore we are going to live or follow after him. Whenever the sea rages, we speak to the seas. That is our new life. Because our identity is in Christ. And if our identity is in Christ, we are going to live like him. We are going to follow him. When he speaks to the sea, I can speak to the sea. Amen. Somebody might say that, you know what? That is weird. You'll never find me speaking to the sea. It's okay. Don't speak to the sea. And guess what? It's going to flood your house. <laughs> it's going to flood your house. I had uh, a testimony that uh, Cheryl and Jay gave about their daughter. They live, I think it's in Norfolk, Nebraska, and when there was floods a few years ago, there was floods everywhere. But they spoke the word of God, and, the, and they said, Cheryl said that the daughter said that when the water came through, it did not come close to their peri uh, territory, like the per perimeter of their house. It did not pass through that. What did that? The angels hearken to the voice of our words. Amen. And when you speak, the angels go working for you. Amen. And therefore, when you don't want to speak what God is speaking, you want to speak what the world is speaking, you'll get the world's results. And the world, when they see the storm, they're going to say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, thank God I have insurance. If it damages something, 
then the insurance is gonna cover up. Guess what, it's gonna come and damage something so that insurance can cover it up. <laughs> I'm gonna speak what the word of God says. Now, don't take this as a license not to get insurance, all right? <laughs> Pastor say we're supposed to speak what Jesus spoke. Jesus didn't have insurance, I'm not gonna have insurance and therefore I'm just gonna be speaking to everything because I don't need insurance anymore. Use wisdom. Amen. Amen. Don't say what I did not say. Amen. And therefore, we have to live like him, continue in him. And we need to be rooted and built up in him. In other words, we need to have our root system go deeper in him and we'll be established in faith. Why? Because faith in him is what enables us to be overcomers. Faith in him is what makes us to be more than conquerors through Christ. And therefore, it is important for us to learn our identity in him and begin to function in our identity in him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If we are going to walk and live in him, we have to understand who he really is. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In other words, you have become a new creature. So if you are in Christ, you're not the same person you used to be. So quit thinking who you used to be and begin to act and become who you are. So if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say, I am a new creation. If you don't believe that, just ask yourself, have you accepted Jesus as your savior? Then I am in Christ. And if, I, if I'm in Christ, then I am a new creation. You need to tell you that I'm a new creature. What does new mean? What does new mean? Never existed before. So in other words, don't try and say, I, I, I always do this. Based in him or out of him. Because if I am in him, I've never existed before. My spirit man is brand new. So one that has never existed before. So therefore, I am a new creature, a new creation in Christ. All the things have passed away. What all the things? The one I used to be has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What? The new man now in me in Christ. He's different from the old. In other words, I'm not who I used to be. Therefore, I will not think like I used to be. I will not act like I used to be, and I will not live like I used to be. Why? Because I'm new. So, you've got to understand this. Because you are new, you don't understand yourself, God has to introduce you to yourself. God has to introduce you to yourself. Because there's a new nature in you, and this new nature, you've never lived it before. You don't know how to live it. And therefore, if God doesn't introduce you to you, then you will never become who you are. Unfortunately, most of the believers didn't, don't really know who they are. They pick up bits and pieces of scriptures and they claim that, thinking that if they say that, that will make them be what they are saying. Yeah. No, you need to understand who you are so that when you speak, you speak from who you are, not what you're trying to be. And therefore, we need to understand who we really are. I've tried that. It never worked out. And therefore, I've missed many things because I never knew who I was in Christ. I was trying to act who I was out of Christ, but I missed out. I've given you quite a few testimonies of my coming to this country. And coming to this country, I was given the rights to be able to work and live and do everything that I need to do. When I was traveling, I was given a right by the airlines to partake of what the airlines have provided. And so I had all that with me. But my mind could not allow me to partake of them. Why? Because I was thinking where I was instead of thinking where I am. If I knew where I am and I knew what I have, I will partake of what is mine. Amen. But if I don't think of that, then I will always think of who I was and then miss out where I am. Amen. And therefore, we as believers, we miss 
what we have because we are still thinking of what we had. And that's why some people will still say, in our family, there's always a genetic disorder of a heart disease. And therefore, this runs in our family. Which family? The new creation or the old one that passed away? Because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, which means a new nature has come in you. If this new nature came in you, then the old one passed away. If the old one passed away, then there's no longer a DNA in my family that still has heart diseases. Amen. Why? Because the new nature is what gives life to this flesh. It is a spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. If my new nature produces life, therefore this body has to come to life because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the very same spirit that will quicken or give life to this mortal body. And therefore, I cannot begin to say that this is running in our family. Yes, in the old family, the old nature, yes, because your spirit is dead, all it's producing is death. And therefore, in your old nature, it is running in the family. In this new nature, no. You see, you have to understand that because mind renewal begins with your identity in Christ. You can meditate everything you want to meditate, but if you don't know who you are in Christ your mind will never be renewed because you're trying to get something that is already yours. So if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. In other words, begin to put those thoughts away. I used to. I don't know. I don't anymore. Why? Because I'm a new creation. You know, if you don't guide your mind, it already has a place to go. Seen a hamster that runs around the, the cage or whatever it is? Runs, 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 runs. And it's running so much and so fast that you think it's going somewhere, but it's going nowhere. It's the same thing. Your mind keeps on running, thinking it's going somewhere, but nowhere. But if you don't guide it, it will take you someplace that will not be, that will not be of value to you. Amen. But because now you are a spirit man, you begin to tell your mind where to go. Amen. You're not going to look like you're working, yet you're not working. Yes, you could be busy, but busy doing what? And so I have to tell my mind, that's why we are being told, you have to renew your mind. Do not be conformed to the image of this world. Why? Because the old man died, and the new man, new man is now alive. And therefore, I have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I am allowing my mind to catch up with the spirit man, so that my mind and my spirit can always flow together. If I don't do that, then guess what? The new man that is in me will not be able to do whatever he needs to do, because the mind says, you can take me there, because I've never been there before. So if you're in Christ... You're a new creation, and that new creation is a new man that is in you. Therefore, to be in Christ is to be united with him. To be in Christ is to be one with him. I am in union with Christ. And if I'm in union with Christ, then I am one with him. And if I am one with him, then I am what he is. Amen. I am not one thing and is another thing. I am one with him. One in spirit with him. And therefore, we've got to understand when you are in Christ, I am in union with him. I am one with him. My spirit and his is one. We are one. That's why he says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not only is he a new creation, but he also says this. There is therefore now no Jew, nor Greek, no male, nor female. Why? Because in Christ, we are one. We are united. We are the same. So if I'm in Christ, we are one with him. I'm the same as he is. Spiritually, I have everything that he has. I can do everything that he does. That's why I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he's anointed. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. And if I'm one with the anointed one, then I am anointed. And if I'm anointed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. In other words, if God was with him, you are with Christ. Therefore, God is with you. And everywhere I go, good things are happening. Because he went about doing good because I am one with him. I'm not another one and he's another one. No, we are one. We are united as one. We walk as one. We live as one. We think as one. Therefore, if you've received Christ, you walk in him as you've received him. 
In other words, I received him as a child, son of God. I received him as my redeemer. I received him as my healer. Therefore, I'm going to walk in health. I'm going to walk in redemption. I'm going to walk in peace because I'm one with him. Amen. Anytime your mind begins to think that, uh, I don't know how I'm going to make this, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Amen. Because you are one with him. And if I'm one with him, then I'm united. So if anyone be in Christ, if anyone is united together with him, he is a new creation. In other words, you are one species that has never existed before. How did you become that? Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20 that Christ, that I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You think about that. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Which means the old man died. And now, I'll say this, just to pass the point across. This flesh now is on lease. Amen. God says, I put my image in there so that I can walk through it. And if God put his image here so he can walk through it, why don't you allow him to walk through that? But if you take him back, then you're denying what, he, what you are and you're trying to be what you're not. And therefore you become confused and you become frustrated because you're trying to be who you are not. And therefore there's this struggle between you and you. Struggle between you and you. Now the question is, do you have two natures in you? Do you have two natures in you? You have one nature. The spirit. That's the one that is living. Because you know what? Get the flesh out. Which nature is there? So is it the new creation or the old creation? And so if it's a new creation, you have one nature in you, not two. If you have two natures in you, then it means the blood of Jesus did not fulfill what it was supposed to fulfill. Which means sin has still got authority and the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus has got no authority. What we do not understand is the blood of Jesus was shed once and for all. And therefore Satan together with sin has got no authority over you. The dominion of sin has been lifted up out of your hand because you are a new species. I don't have two natures in me. I have one nature and that is the nature of Christ. I don't have the nature of Christ and the nature of sin. I don't have two natures in me. My flesh want to act in sin. That's why we are being told, do not present your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin again. In other words, your body was used to sin. It has never lived in righteousness before. And therefore, what it knows, it is to sin. But now, your body is dead to sin because there's a new nature in you. Whatever was producing sin to your body is no longer there. Now there is life in you producing life to your body. Your body has got no understanding. That's why you have to get the word of God. Renew your mind and say, I'm a new creation. And if I'm a new creation, I'm not going to act how I used to be because that man is dead, was crucified, and now the person who is living in here is Christ living in me. And because he's living in me, he's giving life to this flesh. If you want to overcome any sinful act, just remind yourself, I'm a new creation. If sin is in you, if sin is in you, which means you have the nature of sin in you, then Christ never did anything for you. He's competing together with Satan. Because the law of sin and death is governed by Satan. The law of the spirit of life is with Christ. So which law is governing your life? The law of the spirit of life in Christ or the law of sin and death? So your flesh will always want to operate in sin. But if you read Romans chapter 6, you're being told one thing. Consider yourself to be dead to sin. And alive to righteousness. In other words, do you... Agree, you know, to reckon, they use the word reckon over there. Do you know what the term record, to reckon mean? You are considering. In other words, you are agreeing with what God did. I consider that what you did for me through Christ is so. It's also an accounting term that the accounting term, uh, the accountants will use 
to balance out the books. You know, the accountants don't make numbers. They just record the numbers. An accountant cannot sit down and say, okay, it's supposed to be 3,000 over here. I can't figure it out. Just put 3,000 so that it balances. No, they don't make up numbers. They just record numbers. And so you need to record what God has already recorded. God records if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. You say, yes, sir, you are, I am a new creation. You don't make up something. Because that is what has been established. And if that is what has been established, that is who I am. And if that is who I am, then that is what I am. And if that is what I am, then that is who I become. Therefore, sin has got no dominion over me anymore. Why? Because there's a new nature in me. There's a new man in the house, a new sheriff in town. Amen. So we've got to live according to the nature that is in us. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. New creation in Christ Jesus. In other words, what Jesus did for you will make much more sense for you. I kind of like started behind, and I'm going to come in, in the forefront later on, but I started behind so that you can understand when we come to the end of it. So Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. In other words, we are God's workmanship. Workman, workmanship simply means manufacture or produce. In other words, we are God's product. How? Created in Christ. In other words, if you are in Christ, you are created to be a product of God. To do what? To do good works. In other words, you identify with God's production. What God put in Christ is what you ought to be. So that when you are in Christ, you become what Christ is. So in other words, I can be everything that Christ is because God put everything in him so that when I am in Christ, I become everything that he is. And therefore, when I'm in Christ, then now I am God's product. And when I'm God's product, now I can do good works because Jesus did the good works. He went about doing good. Why? Because he understood who he was. When you understand who you are, then you can do who you are. So he went about doing good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God prepared this. This is how you're supposed to live your life. Good works as a result of understanding who I am in Christ. So in Christ, I produce good works. And you understand that this is not because of what I think. This is because of who I am. So I don't do good works to be acceptable before God. I do good works as a result of being a child of God. They're two different things. I may try to do two things so that I can be approved of God, but there's nothing you'll ever do to be approved of God. God did everything through Christ. So through Christ, you're approved of him. And so we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and to good works. Therefore, we have to understand that we have to put on this new man who was created according to God in truth, Righteousness and holiness. Ephesians uh, 4.24 says we have to put on the new man who is, created, who is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now you understand now the person who is in Christ. He was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Which means you are created in Christ, the new man, as righteous and as holy. So all you need to do, you need to be holy as he is holy. But today you'll find people are trying to do things so that they are holy. If I pray, then I'm holy. If I read the word, then I'm holy. If I don't eat this kind of food, then I'm holy. If I don't go to this kind of place, then I'm holy. You're trying to get wax to make you holy, yet you were created holy. And you're created righteous. So anything you try to do to be right with God will never work. Anything you try to do to be holy will never work. Why? Because God created you in Christ. He put everything in Christ so that Christ can be able to make you who you are. So when you are in him, you become everything that he is. If he was righteous and holy, you are righteous and holy. Why? Because that is the nature that is in you. So then now you realize everything that I've been trying to do to be holy, I've just been wasting time. Don't raise up your hand because I did that. 
<laughs> the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. But thank God that God helped me understand this. I remember this particular time I was saying, I'm not going to eat this, I'm not going to eat that, I'm not going to eat that, because if I do that, that's going to pollute me, and then I won't be holy before God. I'm not going to go to this place, I'm not going to go to that place, I'm not going to go to that place, because if I go to those places, they're going to contaminate me, and I won't look good before God. So I begin to do and don't. Do and don't, and do and don't. If I have a lot of do's, I'm right with God. And less don'ts is okay. God says, neither. Neither your do's, nor your don'ts, are not acceptable before me. So you're wasting your time with your do's and don'ts. <laughs> Just be who I've made you to be. That is why now you are being led by the Spirit of God, because now the Spirit of God is inside of you and is bearing witness that you're a child of God, bearing witness with your spirit that you're a child of God, because I am one with Christ. I have the nature of God in me. When the Spirit of God says, I want you to say this. I say that because that is my nature. I don't say that so that I can be right. I don't say that so that I can be seen. I don't say that so that I can be uh, applauded. No, I'm saying that because that is my nature. Grew up in a village where we had roosters. You don't have to tell rooster it is 4 o'clock in the morning, begin to crow. It just automatically go out of its nature. Ooh, 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 ooh. It is its nature. We drive vehicles. I get into the garage. I start that vehicle. I don't, say, I don't tell it when I get in this car, start going vroom, vroom. I just go in there, put the key in the ignition, just vroom, it goes. Why? It is its nature. That's what it has been made to do. Once you are in Christ, it is your nature to live as righteous and to be holy. That is me. I don't have to do anything to be holy. He did everything for me to be holy. Amen. Amen. Now, somebody will say, are you trying to give us the right now to do anything we want to do? If you don't understand who you are, then you'll ask for permission to do that. You'll ask for permission to do that. You see, a lack of understanding is what I say, and now I can do anything I want to do because I'm the righteousness of God, I'm holy, I don't have to think of this, I don't have to think of that. No, the sons of God are being led by the Spirit of God. Amen. Therefore, I will not burden somebody else, what do you think I'm supposed to do? What do you think I'm supposed to say? What do you think? No, what is your nature telling you? Yeah. What is your conscience telling you? Yeah. Because now you have a spirit. What is your spirit telling you? And if you know it, take the consequences. Don't bring it back to me so that you can say, you told me to do that. No, what is your responsibility? Because once you become a child of God, you're responsible. And when you're responsible for your life, why? Because you're being led by God. God never led you that I am righteous and I'm holy. And I know what to do because the Spirit of God is leading me. Now I identify with Him. I don't let people tell me what to do. I follow what the Holy Spirit is telling me because there could be something that is right that you're doing that it's not right with me. So I can do that. Why? Because according to my nature, I'm being led not to do that. And therefore, I cannot copy what you're doing because you are following God and God is telling you something and I'm following God and God is telling me something. So we are not comparing one another. We are not competing with one another. Why? Because if you pray to God and God led you to be able to give away your vehicle like MFA said, I'm not going to do the same thing because I need a new vehicle. Because, you see, my motive is wrong because I'm looking at getting a vehicle instead of listening to whom I am. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, I get frustrated. Like, okay, how come if God is the same, he's not a respecter of persons. You did that, you got the results. How come I'm not getting the results? It's because you are following man instead of following God. You're being told, you walk and follow after Christ like you received him. Not follow man. The man is following Christ. But are you following Christ? If you are following Christ, the same spirit will bear witness with your spirit. Amen. And therefore, we have to understand that now this new man has been created according to God. According to God in righteousness, in true righteousness and holiness. If that is the case, then let's see how this happened in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love <clears throat> with which he loved us. When, 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 when? Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love towards us. While we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love towards us by sending his son. Therefore, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, when we were sinners, he sent his son to die for us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. In other words, 
You are made alive together with Christ. In other words, you are one together. You are brought to life together with him. You are not trying to get his life. You are not trying to get the life that he has. You are made alive together with him. Why? When he died to sin, you died together with him in sin. When he was raised up together, you were raised up together with life in him. Therefore, you have the same life that he has. So God made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive together with Christ. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, and raised us up together. In other words, not only did he make you alive, but he raised you up together with him and made us sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ, you have been raised up together and you have been made to sit together with him in heavenly places. With him in heavenly places. So I want you to think of this man, a spirit man, who has been made alive together with Christ. Can you see the life of Christ? The life of Christ. You are one with him. And therefore you've been raised up together with him. Made alive, raised up together with him. And then you've been made to sit together with him in heavenly places. So the place that you are sitting at is a place of peace. In other words, you've entered into rest when you are in Christ. Now you need to stay there and function from that place. Colossians tells us, if you've been raised up together with him, therefore set your affections above where you are seated with him. In other words, now bring your mind to the place because your mind has not caught up with where you are yet spiritually. You are seated right now on this chair, but yet you're seated right over there. Your body is here, but actually spiritually, there is no distance. You are seated there with him. And therefore, when you understand where you are spiritually sitting, then now I have authority because I have an identification with him. I identify with Christ. And when I identify with Christ, I am one with him. And when I am one with him, I get the results that he gets. I don't get second class things. I don't get two different things. I get the same thing. And if you begin to look at that, then you realize that your life now changes. Now, let me bring you now to the place that shows us how Christ did this. We have read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, in, verses, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verses 21, it says, For he made him, him who? Christ, who knew no sin, to be seen for us. Why? that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in other words, Jesus was made to be seen so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, for me to be the righteousness of God, it has to be in Christ. So when you say you are righteous, it's not because of what you did, it is because of what Christ did. So I am made to be right standing with God, which means to be righteous Simply means this, to stand before God as if sin has never existed before without any sense of guilt or shame or condemnation. In other words, there is no shame, no guilt, nor condemnation. That is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of man tries to do things to be right, then they get condemned and they get shameful and then they walk away. But the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Jesus did it. And because Jesus did it, now you must have faith in what Jesus did. Therefore, in order for you to be the righteousness of God in Christ, you have to understand this. Faith through the blood of Jesus plus anything or minus anything is equal to the righteousness of God. Which means anything you try to add to become doesn't qualify. Anything you try to subtract to become doesn't qualify. It is faith through his blood and that's it. Not in addition to prayers, not in addition to meditating on the word of God, not in addition to coming to church, it is faith in the blood plus or minus nothing makes me right with God. 
Why? Because Jesus fulfilled what is required to be right with God. And now when you get in Christ, you have met the standards of what Jesus is. And therefore God sees you as he sees Christ. And if he sees you as he sees Christ, then now for now you have the identity of Christ. When you have the identity of Christ, now you can begin to operate in the authority of Christ. If you do not understand that, I'll try to pray today and say today I felt really good when I was in my prayer and anybody who is sick today, I can lay hands on them and they're going to be healed. Someone calls me at three in the afternoon. Somebody is sick, like, you know what? After church today, uh, I haven't been in prayer, so I don't think this will work. You cannot operate in the authority because you are thinking what you do is what will make the authority flow. The authority is flowing in the identity. And if the authority is flowing in the identity, you have to understand that the identity is not plus something or minus something. Amen. It is faith in the blood plus or minus nothing. Amen. If you don't understand that, then you will be frustrated any time you try to exercise the authority that God has given to us. So to be right with God is because of what Jesus did. What did he do? He was made to be seen. <clears throat> He was made to be seen for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, you receive the righteousness of God, not your own righteousness, the righteousness which is of God. And the righteousness which is of God was fulfilled in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you have met the requirements of God and that's it. I have met the requirements of God. And once I've met the requirements of God, then I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. Why? Because it was met and I am in and that's it. Now, the issue is, our minds begin to play tricks on us. That's so easy, right? Yes, the gospel is so easy. You need somebody else to confuse you in it. That's it. That's what it means to be righteous. That's what it means to have your identity in Christ. You mean I don't have to do anything? Have you accepted Christ? That's all you are to do. That's it. Well, what about me who's been... Born again for 50 years and I've been doing this and I've been doing that. Well, it is not by works. Because you're going to boast on it. Amen. And if there is any boasting we need to have, let us boast in faith. Amen. Faith in Christ. And therefore you realize that now it is easy for me to begin to get God's result because now I understand where I belong and I understand who I am. And because I understand who I am and I understand where I belong then now I am able to begin to renew my mind to who I am because my mind now will say, wait a minute, you can do that. Why not? Why not? <coughs> Things are not happening to you because you didn't do this. Wait, why not? Amen. You see, mind renewal begins with your identity. If you understand that he was made to be seen for me so that it might be the righteousness of God, question is, what did you do here to be the righteousness of God. All you had to be accept him. There's nothing you had to do. That's why in the Old Testament, the high priest could go into the holies of holies once a year and offer sacrifices to do what? To purge the conscience of the people and then next year again wait and do it again. Because if that blood could take away the sins, then it didn't have to be done every year. But Jesus did it once and for all. Amen. And therefore, we need to have faith in the blood. In, in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11, verses 12, and then we're going to read verses 14 as well. He says, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. Which means when Christ came, good things were supposed to come. Which means today, change your thinking. Amen. People say, you know what, the world is getting worse and worse. Christ did not come for things to get worse and worse. He came as a high priest of the good things to come, which means for the believers, we should be rejoicing. My identity in him, I should be rejoicing because there are good things that are coming. And then he goes on to say, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Verses 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Look at that part. With his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once and for all, which means he doesn't have to do it again. Why did he do that? 
to obtain eternal redemption, which means you have been redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? To be bought back at a price. In other words, the value was on that blood. That blood was sinless. And when he played, when he shed that blood, and he took that blood into the holy place, he did it once and for all, and he obtained eternal redemption for us all. Now you need to recognize that. And when you recognize that, you accept what was done for you and say, I have obtained an eternal redemption once and for all. And therefore now I am one with him. And because I'm one with him, verses 14, <clears throat> how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirits offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In other words, now the blood that was shed for me now is cleansing my conscience from dead works. In other words, now I'm not thinking under the law of sin and death. I'm thinking under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The blood cleanses my conscience from dead works so that I can serve the living God. If you ever find a challenge in serving the living God, plead the blood. I declare the blood of Jesus over my life. It was shed for me. It has purged or cleansed my conscience from dead works. Why? I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have been given the authority. I've been given the right to stand before God as if sin has never existed before without any sense of shame, guilt, or condemnation. Why? He shed his blood. He entered in the most holy place one and for all, and he obtained eternal redemption for me, and that blood cleanses my conscience, and therefore I can serve God with a clear conscience because Jesus paid it all, and the price was right. If you have that mindset, then now it is easy for us to begin to walk now in the authority of Christ. Amen. Now it is easy for me not to abuse the authority that I have. Why? He gave us authority in his name. And if we can function in the authority of his name, in understanding who we really are, being made right with God through Christ, then it is easy to execute his authority. Why? Because it is not what I'm doing, it is what he did. And therefore, when I'm exercising this authority, it is him who's getting the glory. I've been made righteous, not because of what I've done, what he did. Amen. And therefore, when I talk about it, it is about him, not about me. I've been made the righteousness of God, not I've been made in the righteousness of Anthony. Amen. <laughs> Anthony <clears throat> has been made right with God. In other words, I stand before God as if sin has never existed before in my life. Someone will say, Really? Say yes. How come? The blood of Jesus has cleansed my conscience from dead work so that I can serve the living God. In other words, I was made alive with Christ. Not dead. I was made alive with Christ. And therefore my conscience has been purged from dead work so I can serve the living God. If you keep on thinking of sin, you are having a sin consciousness and your sin consciousness needs to be purged by the blood of Christ so you can have a righteous consciousness so that you can live and serve the living God as one who's been made alive together with him. Amen. So how can you live as one who has never had sin or any sense of guilt or shame or condemnation, he did it through the blood and I have faith in the blood and faith in the blood plus or minus nothing makes me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So you and I have the identity of God. And when we have that identity, we need to walk in it. We need to live it. Not based on what somebody did. Now, you may feel guilty or condemned. Just go to Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and read where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Am I in Christ? Amen. If I'm in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. In other words, whatever you are to be condemned for, Christ was. Amen. And when you are crucified with him, it is the man who was being condemned that was crucified. That was the judgment. Yeah. And therefore the judgment has been passed and have been set free. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I'm free Amen. to serve the living God. And I won't let anybody add any baggage to that. Don't bring any guilt or condemnation to it. I am glad to be free. And so are you. Amen. Amen. Walk in the freedom, in the liberty wherewith you have been made free with Christ and never let anybody else again entangle you with the yoke of bondage. Amen. Amen. You are free in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Say heavenly father, heavenly father. 
I thank you for your plan for me to be right with you. Through Christ, you made him to be everything you wanted me to be. Now in him, I can be everything that he is. I am healed. I am righteous. I am free. I am peaceful. I am strong. I am filled with your glory. I am full of your life. I can live victoriously because I am a victor. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning, we'd like for us to be able to take communion. And when we're taking this communion, we have to do it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Remember, he shed his blood, his body was wounded and broken. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that while they were together, he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he says, eat this, or do this in remembrance of me. What are you remembering? You are remembering that when Christ came, Jesus came, he came to reconcile us back with God. In other words, he came to restore us back to God. Restore us in the fellowship that we never had with God. We lost this as a result of disobedience. And the penalty of sin is death. So he had to pay the penalty of sin, which is death. Now, in the process of him being killed, they had to wound him. And he said that his wounding or his beatings was as a result of your healing. In other words, your body ought to be healed and ought to be made whole because he received the wounding in his own body so that your body does not need to be wounded. And therefore, when we take this communion together, we are doing it in remembrance of what he did for us. In other words, you need to stand in who you are as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and begin to say that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and because God dwells in this body and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I therefore take authority that has been given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ and I command every sickness, I command every disease, I command every symptoms of sickness and disease to leave my body in Jesus' name. Why? Jesus spoke to bodies and they were healed. And I speak to this body because now I am a high priest of this body. And through the blood of Jesus, I can command sickness and disease to leave this body. And I do it in remembrance of what Jesus did because that is the authority that has been given to me in the name of Jesus Christ. Sickness, you have to leave. Body, be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. Why? Because I have the right. As many as received him, he gave them the right to be called the sons of God. If you have the right to be called the son of God, you have the right to operate as the son of God. And a son of God ought to walk in health and healing. Amen. What if I speak and it's not going away? Keep on speaking until it goes because it's supposed to obey you. Don't give up because it never, gave, it never obeyed you. Do you ever have an animal or a child that you speak to and they don't do what you tell them to do? Do you give up and say, you know what, I spoke to the dog, the dog never listened to me. I spoke to my child, the child never listened to me, so just forget about it. No, you stand there and say, you are going to do what I ask you to do. You better listen. Why? I am in authority, and when I'm in authority, I release this authority that has been given to me by God as a parent. This is what I ought to do, and therefore I'm training you in the way you're supposed to go. And therefore, you ought to listen because if you're going to listen to your parents, it is going to be well with you and you're going to live a long life. If a physical father can speak to his child and his child obey him and it is going to be well with him and he's going to live a long life, how much more will your heavenly father, if you obey him, give you life and good things? Amen. If a heavenly father can do that, now if an earthly father can do that, Heavenly Father will do that. So what do you need to do? Speak to your body. Because your father sees it and says that, you know, it is my great pleasure you are exercising my authority that I've given to you. And so say this with me. Heavenly Father, I am forever thankful for the body of Jesus that was broken for me. Because of the brokenness of his body, mine is made whole. I speak health to my flesh. I speak health to my organs. I speak life to my body. And I say, body, be healed. Life of God, saturate this body 
In Jesus' name, I am thankful that I am healed and I'm made whole by Jesus' stripes. Amen. Go ahead and receive the bread. The same night, he also took the cup and said that this is the blood of my new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, now you need to remember that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Through the shedding of the blood, we have now been given access to stand before the Lord boldly. Why? Because he's our father. He's not our enemy. Now we do not call him God only. We also call him father. And through the shedding of the blood, we've been forgiven of our sins. And God has forgotten our sins. He does not remember them anymore. Therefore, you need to tell yourself, my sins have been forgiven and they've been washed through the blood of Jesus. And there is nothing that is difficult for the blood of Jesus to take care of. Because I've been redeemed. So say, Heavenly Father, I am forever grateful for the blood of Jesus. It has cleansed me from every dead works. I've been redeemed from sin. I've been redeemed from the powers of sin. The blood of Jesus speaks better things on my behalf. And I testify of that blood that I'm a child of God. I've been washed. I've been cleansed. And I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I overcome with that testimony. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and take of it. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we are forever grateful for what you have prepared for us and what you've made available for us. Now, Father Lord, we choose to identify with who you are as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that you have empowered us. You have given us authority over every serpent and over every scorpion. And you've commanded us to trample over every evil work and nothing shall by any means harm us. And Lord, we choose to stand boldly and we choose to, to declare who we are and who we are in Christ. And I'll declare that the children of God, we will walk as the sons of God. Your light shining in us, we will let it so shine before great men that they may be able to see you and honor you and give glory to you. And now I thank you that any weapon formed against us shall not prosper. Any tongue reason against us in judgment will not prevail because this is our heritage as the children of God. And now declare that we are blessed coming in and we are blessed going out. And we'll never be the same because we've had an encounter with our Heavenly Father. Amen. We thank and we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much for being here today. I believe that God has ministered to you in one way or another. And your life is not the same. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Have a good for, uh, uh, September 4th, Labor Day, right? Enjoy it. And thank God for the freedom that we have. Amen. And looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday as well as next Sunday. Remember the bookstore is on sale 50% and have a blessed week.